Well, I went to school in, in Bridgewater for the elementary school in a, uh, it had two room schoolhouse. And luckily it was one of these places, schools where the second bell would ring and I could get out of bed and make it, <laughs> make it to school. <laughs> I, I uh, used to like to sleep on Monday through Friday mornings. But Saturday morning, I was up at daylight and I didn't have enough time usually for doing all the things I used to do. But of course, uh, in those days, we didn't have any, uh, early days, we didn't have uh, ski, anything. We had to climb to on skis and we didn't have any but toe straps. And most of the skis that we had were jumping skis. They had three grooves in the bottom of the ski to keep it going straight. So it wasn't for turning, but we built jumps out of orange crates and so forth and do a lot of jumping. But it was always something to do. In, uh, I guess it was in the 30s, uh, uh, that Bunny Bertram uh, started a ski hill down, down in Woodstock. It wasn't Suicide Six, it was on the back side of Suicide Six. And he uh, tried all kinds of things to get the, the rope toe to work. And they worked a whole year on it. And the second year they had it pretty well uh, cornered, I think. They had, they had a, 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 a chute like this and it had things like that around on the inside so when the rope came around it would grab in the in the v at the bottom of the v so that would pull you up well it was fine and i used to get down and they tested it out but uh, it was it was pretty two two and a half years or two years before it really worked well and then they put a flag up there about 100 yards, and then the next guy could get on. And if they get too many on there, it would slip. Well, I went down and they had it fixed up, so it was 50 cents a day to ski there. And I went down with my jumping skis and I stood in line and grabbed a hold of the rope and I made it all the way to the top. When I got up there, the, I looked down, hell, this was much, much steeper than anything I'd ever skied on. And it was a big uh, hill, but it's part of, they used to graze the cows and stuff. So there was all kinds of uh, cow, pads around the thing, but I would get on my skis and head them across the hill. And I'd go till I stopped, take the skis off and go back the other way. And I did that all day. And Alex Bright and, and some of his friends from Boston used to ski in uh, Europe. Well, they came up, they heard about the rope tow and they saw, saw me doing this and they had a little warming hut at the bottom. And uh, my father came to pick me up. And they, uh, Alex went to my father and said, this guy's going to be a good skier someday. He got, you ought to get him some uh, good skis and some bindings. So my father got me in the car and we went to Gillingham's, which is a hard, uh, you know, a general store had sold everything. So I went and bought a pair of skis and some 
uh, bindings and they were just little straps that went around back, but at least it was, would hold me in the skis. Well, Jesus, I got those and I uh, went out there the next, next week and they were all there and they taught me how to turn a little bit. Boy, that was fun. I, I was hooked. And so I, my father came back to pick me up that next, next uh, time, next uh, that weekend. And they said, doctor, he's got to have some ski boots. Those rubber sh shoes don't work very well. <laughs> So we went back to Gillingham's and got a pair of bass ski boots. The best sponges you ever saw in your life. <laughs> and so that started me off. And so I skied there all that, that year. And I noticed that they had ski poles. So I went to the um, sawmill in town and uh, got up some dowels, you know, about, and I cut them off the right length, really tall. We had them real tall then. And I drilled a hole through this way on the bottom in this way. And I got uh, some thongs and I took two coffee cans and cut out the middle of it and tied these things on, and so I had a pair of ski poles, ran the thing through this and then this way. Well, geez, they, the Al Bright and Al Sice came the next weekend, two or three weekends afterwards, and they were laughing like hell <laughs> about it. And uh, so they came back the following a week, and they brought a pair of a blue ski poles, bamboo, but they were painted blue. And they uh, put on a race. Well, they figured probably I'd win the race, I guess. But anyway, I, I did, I won, won the race, and so the prize was the, those poles. Well, I took them home and I mean, I just worshiped those things. They were really fancy, you know? And so I used them all week. I set up a, a slalom course in the backyard, got a nice hill in my backyard. And I was running down through these poles. And I hit my skis on the side of the poles and it, all the blue stuff came off. Well, boy, I felt pretty bad. But anyway, <laughs> a couple of weeks later, they saw me. There was no blue hardly left on them. <laughs> so that was really the start of it. But then I got better and better equipment and then by this time Suicide 6 opened up. Bunny had moved from the Gilberts Hill over to Suicide so I started skiing over there. Well Bunny he just rented from the hill uh, from them and then that's why he moved to over on the other side of the hills because they wanted to make the money. And so they set up their own place and Bunny moved round and over there and set this all up. Well, he took all the, all the business away from them. And because that, that slope was really a bad slope because it faced south, southeast. So it used to get cooked. I mean, it used to get glare ice on there. I remember one time uh, Mr. Gilbert was trying to soften the s snow up to use the 
harrow to try to uh, dig up the ice. <laughs> he was, he didn't have much of an idea about skiing. Well, Bunny uh, built himself a, a beautiful uh, hut. Not a hut, it was a, just a nice lodge on the backside of Suicide Six, and he had two or three toes over there on these nice little hills, in plus Suicide Six. And he chewed tobacco like you can't believe. But if you wanted, and when you got there in the morning, if you want to know where he was, you just get, look at the tracks of where he'd spit <laughs> all around. <laughs> And Bunny was a great guy. I mean, uh, I know when I went out for the uh, Olympic tryouts out west, he uh, sup supervised my cousin, Hal Cotting, and me out there. Us, we were just young, young guys, 16, 17 years old, something like that. And he was, he was just so damn nice to us and took good care of us. Yeah, Bunny uh, had six and he had one, uh, three toes in this little valley, which was really, really nice little slopes. And he really had it made. You could ski on this side of the slope. If you wanted to really ski, you went over on the six. And he had uh, a number of races there. The Dartmouth ski team used to come over there and train a lot. It was a great hill to train on because you could get so many runs in. But then two years after Bunny uh, got set up and he got things pretty well figured out how to how to do it. Then they repaired all over the place. They were up in uh, Middlebury and over in Hanover and so forth, but he was the only one that really did a big business. Bunny called me up one uh, Friday night and the skiing was super. And he said, Wendy, can you come down tomorrow and be here at daylight and be ready to ski until dark. And this is on Suicide Six. That meant, meant going down, grab hold of the rope, go up and down. And I forgot many trips I made, but it was a hundred and something. And the thing was running about 25 to 30 miles an hour. So you really were skiing going back up. But I don't know how many, but anyway, Europe was trying to get people to come over there skiing, how many vertical feet you could get in a day. And I don't know, I just broke all the records they ever had. <laughs> We used to, uh, Bunny used to have uh, races amongst us kids and so forth. And then we had, uh, I started the first high school ski team in, I guess, probably the country. And uh, then Hanover, I mean, uh, uh, Lebanon, New Hampshire, they had a ski team, and they had a pretty good one. And these were all four event uh, things. And then Stowe had one, uh, Rutland, and then they all got them. And then they used to have the, the uh, high school state championships at Stowe. And they had some pretty damn good races and some good, good skiers. Norm Richardson and a whole bunch of them. And then the skiing, uh, the, the colleges had a lot of, lot of racing. And uh, 
So they, and then the, the clubs like uh, Pico, uh, Woodstock, and all of Stowe, there was a Stowe Cup in all kinds of races all over New England and up in New Hampshire and all over. So every weekend you could go away to a race somewhere. And I remember one time my, my father said, why are you racing this week? And I said, I don't, I don't, there isn't any place. He said, I just read in the paper that the Southern Vermont State Championships are down in uh, Manchester. I said, I'm not going down south to go skiing. <laughs> and I thought going down there would be going down to the hot country, you know. But anyway, I went down and I won that one. I know I, I, did, I did pretty well. And of course, uh, I skied a lot with the, the Dartmouth guys, with Dick and all those. I raced against them, and then Stowe had big races. This, the Sugar Slalom at Stowe, and I won that, and the Addis Memorial twice, and I don't know, a lot of different races, but it was fun. We raced here in the east, and then uh, my, I remember my father said they have an Olympic tryouts out, out uh, at Mount Hood. And there's some races at Sun Valley, and there was two or three races out there. So we went out there, and we, Hal Cotting, myself, went out, and we did very well. We were right up there. So I went to the tryouts and Dick got first and I got second in the tryouts out there, Dick Dorrance. And uh, I was fifth in the uh, Open, which was all the guys from Europe and the professionals that were making money. But back in those days, you didn't, get anywhere near any money. If you did, you got kicked out of the amateur ranks. I went to, went to Norwich University on the ski team there and did very well. And then the war broke out. And I volunteered for the ski troops. Well, I uh, had to wait to get in for my basic training. And then I went to Fort Lewis, Washington. And there, I went from there up to into Canada to the Columbia Ice Fields and did some supposedly secret work on uh, what, what, what is now a snow cat the first ones, and we, all the different companies would bring their machines up to the, the uh, glacier. And the Canadian uh, Army was, was supposed to do it, but they gave up. They said they couldn't, they couldn't make a road to the glacier, and, and they could knew that they couldn't build a road onto the glacier. So our, uh, the 10th Mountain Division said we could do it. And we went up, we built the road in about three, four days to the base of the, of the ice field. And then we started and we built a road right up over the, the ice. I can tell a lot of stories about that thing. <laughs> that was something. But we did, we built a road. We went uh, 
some of us took our picks and so forth. We went up and we built a road that was sheer, sheer ice here. And we built a road around like this and up there. And then we had to, all the crevasses, we had to put big logs like that across and then one in the middle and then drive our vehicles across it. And we did that for about two miles. So we got up to where it was pretty was solid. And it was, it was something that anybody would have said was impossible. But we did it. I was in 10th, I was in 10th recon. I was in the training part of the thing because I was in fairly early and Walter Prager was uh, used to be the coach of of the Dart Ski team. He was uh, my first sergeant, and so it was a, some pretty pretty fantastic guys in that outfit. The war, I went back to Sun Valley, and I taught skiing there, and I raced, I raced with them for a while, and I won the thing I'm most proud of. I won the Diamond Sun, which is only about 15 of them in the world. People like uh, Zeno Colo and Dick Dorrance and people like that. That they get them. You have to, you have to make a certain time from the top of Baldy to the bottom, and you have to ski. It's not groomed. It's pretty rough, and you average a little over uh, 60 miles an hour in there. It's very fast. In the summertime, I was a uh, public relations uh, guy for Sun Valley and Union Pacific. So I went uh, back to New York. I had an office in New York and in uh, Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. and Boston. And I worked between those going around uh, doing public relations work, and that was a great job. Boy, I, I was making good money then. And then I taught skiing, of course, in the winter. I just remember one uh, person it was Claudette Colbert, and her husband was a doctor, and he'd come up, but he'd have to go back to his business, and so he's told me, he said, I want you to be her escort no matter where she goes. And I taught her, you know, most of the time. And I know one day we were skiing up on top and uh, the lift operator at the top, she always let her go up first and she got off and then I came up. And he said, I'm going to have my arms around her before the day's over. I said, I didn't say a word. So a couple of months by, and finally he came out and he reached around and helped her off. And she turned around and she let him have it. I never heard a teamster swear like she did. <laughs> And so I went right on by. I didn't, didn't want to get mixed up in that. And I went down and waited for her. And she came down around the corner laughing. Like, she said, I bet he doesn't do that again. <laughs> well, Warren Miller, uh, he, he took over Dick's job really and 
So he was taking pictures of different people and doing uh, projects like that. And when he first got out there, he uh, came in a, a, a car it was a little trailer on those, uh, I don't know what they call them. You just crawl in. Well, he was living in that. And hell, he didn't have enough money to f buy food even. But they let him park his, his thing out in the back parking lot. And he and I got to be pretty good friends. And uh, so, uh, I would take uh, a cup of coffee out to him and some food, and he would eat that. That would be probably about all he had all day. And I got him a job packing first, because we used to, out then in those days, the only grooming you got was packing soaps. And so I got him a job packing the slopes, but hell, he'd take his camera everywhere he went. And they, he would be doing more picture taking and, and uh, he was packing. So they, they kind of let him go. But anyway, he, he kept on. And finally, they realized that, you know, we had these learned as ski weeks. And we had hundreds of people came to these things. So we needed extra instructors. So I went to uh, Friedel Pfeiffer, who was the head of the school. I said, Friedel, I think uh, Warren is a damn good skier. I think he would help out with us. And so he uh, asked me to have him come over and he interviewed him and he got the job. Then he moved in with me in my room, and so we were together. And during that time, uh, Warren and I had to, to represent the ski school on Wednesday nights at the uh, inn, and we dressed up. I dressed up like a woman, and he, of course, like a man with his. Uh, little shorts and stuff on. I was pretty small compared with him, and he used to throw me over his head, and I had on a skirt, you know? And it was pretty funny. So that was a big hit all winter long. So every Wednesday night, we had to do that. Dick, well, he was, an unbelievable skier. He just never seemed to lose any meat. I never could beat that guy. <laughs> yeah. He was, he was unbeatable, I think. It seemed so, you turn, you think you had a really good run, but he'd get get by him by a fraction of a second or something. And at one of the Harriman Cup races, he'd won the Harriman Cup two years in a row. And uh, so Mr. Uh, Harriman, you know, Averill Harriman, he was the president of uh, Union Pacific and he owned uh, Sun Valley and so Dick was the head photographer around there and Mr. Uh, Rogers didn't want to buy another cup there was a beautiful great big silver uh, bowl like this and he had his name and the, the thing was if somebody won it three times they could keep it well he uh, Mr. Harriman uh, invited the, the Austrian ski team over, the French ski team over, and put them up over there, and uh, against Dick, of course, but he wouldn't let Dick uh, 
trained. He was really, he had him doing pictures of these guys training. And I remember I was uh, going down the day of the race and I was just side slipping down, looking at it and so forth. And here comes Dick Dorrance walking up with a hatchet and he was trimming the trees. And so we went up and then he skied down and figured it all out. The day of the race, he just did something really crazy. He came down these things, it was just, he probably doing 60, 70 miles an hour going between trees like this because there were turns like that that we all had to go around but there was no 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 control gates on each one right so he could do any damn thing he wanted well they didn't figure he that anybody would ever do a thing like that well he did and he made it down to what they call the hog back like this and he went off and he went in the air and he ran into a hot, hot dog stand and fell, got up, ran through the finish and won by, I think, 30 seconds. That was a big, against all those guys. <laughs> but, I mean, none of those guys would even think of going through that, those little narrow things like that. It's crazy. Ernest Hemingway used to come out and he spent, he had a, a place there, used to, but he usually stayed at the lodge and he did a lot of his writing there at the lodge. And he uh, would be typing and so forth. He'd be absolutely nude. He liked to work when he was in the nude. And the maids would come and they knock and they say, come in. And <laughs> he'd make them clean his room and stuff and do all this stuff, but he'd just keep on writing. Taylor Williams uh, was my roommate in the, in the fall in Sun Valley, and he used to be the, the hunting guide, fishing guide for Hemingway when he came into town and so he asked Hemingway if I could come along and so I got to meet him and fish and hunt with him a couple of times and we went what we called jump shooting along the uh, the river there and uh, he said whatever you catch, shoot today. He said, we're going to eat tonight. So I went back down and Taylor Williams said to me, he said, don't you dare not eat what he puts on your plate. He said, you're doing very well, he said. And he likes you very much. And but he's going to be watching, see what kind of a guy you are. And so I went down and we had quite a few drinks and so forth. And uh, he finally went out and he prepared. I know I got two ducks, I think, and they got some ducks. But it was about four, four ducks that he was going to cook. I don't know. If, I saw them, they were absolutely had, nothing had been done to them. So he went out and stuck them in the oven. And you know, we had we had another another drink. And I don't know, it couldn't have been, I don't know what, how long it was. But he said, well, everything's ready. And he went out and he made some potatoes and stuff. And he put those 
ducks on a, on a platter. And he reached over and grabbed hold, and the blood just came out of them all over the place. He picked it up and started eating them. And Taylor Williams, he, he did the same. So I, 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 I had a rough time, boy, trying to get that raw <laughs> duck down my throat. But I did. And so it, I passed the test. And so uh, they went on a, a elk hunt, and Hemingway invited me to go. And we had uh, mules and everything to carry all that stuff. And it was really, really good. And Taylor Williams, the guide, he did all the cooking. And so we had uh, couldn't and he got a really nice elk. And so we came back and invited me to have a meal of the elk. Well, I like it fairly, fairly <laughs> rare anyway. So we, we ate some pretty raw steaks. <laughs> But boy, he was a rugged guy, I'll tell you. But he was, he was so, so nice to everybody. He was a great guy. Despite Wendy's relationship with Hemingway, Warren Miller, Claudette Colbert, Cecil B. DeMille, and other luminaries, his Sun Valley days came to an abrupt end when they ended his public relations position, leaving him stranded in New York City. After Sun Valley, Wendy went to work for the legendary Sig Buckmeyer, a founding father of alpine skiing in North America at his world-famous New York City shop, coming to Vermont on weekends to teach skiing at Bromley. After setting up ski shops in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles for Abercrombie & Fitch and establishing a store for a and in Brooklyn, the time was right to go out on his own. My mother-in-law said, Wendy, why don't you start your own ski shop? And I said, well, I know it's, it's going to take a lot of money. She said, don't worry about the money. I'll put the money up. You just set up the ski shop. Well, they uh, got around to name it. And my wife and her mother both said, it's going to be Wendy's Ski Shop. Well, I knew it was a mistake to call it Wendy's Ski Shop. Well, it, it, people knew me, but a lot of people, new people coming into the business uh, didn't, you know, didn't know me that well. And so, anyway, I did fairly well for a few years, and then uh, the discounters in uh, Albany and around started getting into the business, and they just ruined the whole thing. They were they they could buy in such so much volume that they could get things much cheaper than I could. And people just didn't understand. And that was back when they f first started. Everything had to go on sale, you know. The minute you get in the door, when you're going to go on sale? Christmas time, they come in, when you're going to go on sale? And it used to drive me crazy. <laughs> they didn't realize you had didn't have very much uh, margin there. But anyway, I had it for about four or five years. And I wanted to get out of it. And so I did. But in the meantime, I got into a bicycling and I had a bicycle shop in the summertime there. And we did very well with that. And I finally sold the whole business 
and got out. Hans Palmer came to me one day and he said, what are you going to do now? I said, I don't know. I'm going to take it easy for a while. I've been working pretty hard here. And he said, he said, I'd like to have you come up and take care of the place for me and mow the lawns and do all that stuff. So I said, fine, that's great. I'll be outdoors all the time. That's what I want. So I did, and then I taught skiing. He was teaching ski. He didn't teach ski, but he was the assistant head of the ski school. So I used to drive him in his car to work every day. And I take for nearly 40 years, Wendy was a fixture at the Stratton Ski School. Many of those years would find him on snow every day of the season, and the number of people whose lives he touched with his skill and his humor is the stuff of legend. Others came and went. The resort grew and changed dramatically, but through poor seasons and epic ones, Wendy was the one constant. Moving about the property from job to job in his personal golf cart. From spring to fall, he's largely responsible for maintaining the resort's executive golf course, which is dedicated in his honor. Wendy can no longer ski, but he does continue to pursue another passion. It's a three-wheel bike, but it's louvered wheels in the back, so in the corner it really corners well. And it's got 27 speeds ahead, and you can go practically anywhere with it, but it makes me mobile. I can go to the post office, I can go shopping, I don't do my laundry, I do everything in it. In recognition of Wendy's love of cycling, the town of Manchester in 2009 designated a bicycle loop around town that passes in front of his home as Wendy's Way. There are accomplished people, and then there is Wendy Cram, whose exploits make you realize how much can be done in one lifetime. He was an Olympian, truly one of the best ski racers of his era, a friend and confidant to world-famous literary figures, film stars, and directors, a member of the most elite ski troops in the U.S. military, a man who made his passion for outdoor sports into a lifetime of achievements that continue to this day. Wendy's is truly a life well-lived, jam-packed with memories and accomplishments. And as anyone who knows Wendy will tell you, he not only did everything world-class, he always did it with a smile.